right, so I am glad that you're all here tonight and I'd like to introduce Dr. Agar, uh, Professor John William McDonald Agar. John, and he does prefer to be called John, graduated from Monash University Medical School in 1970 and trained in nephrology in Melbourne and University of Massachusetts Medical School in Worcester, USA. In 1978, he returned to his home city of Geelong where he established and ran a clinical nephrology practice until his retirement in February, 2020. John has published more than 250 peer reviewed papers and abstracts, four book chapters, two dialysis related books, one with me, and more than 90 kidney views blogs as the hemodialysis advisor and internet consultant to Wisconsin based Medical Education Institute since 2010. He's been an invited lecturer on dialysis topics in 16 countries, especially on his three pet topics, nocturnal home hemodialysis, extended hour and higher frequency hemodialysis, and environmental sustainability in dialysis and nephrology, founding the global concept of green dialysis and green nephrology. Among his awards for contributions in nephrology are the Order of Australia Medal, the Priscilla Kincaid Smith Medal, and the International Society of Hemodialysis Vilut Twardowski Lifetime Achievement Award in Hemodialysis. I will turn it over to John. Thank you, Dory. Uh, I'm just going to do the share screen thing now. Okay. Thank you, Dory. And as you know, this is um, a series of slide sets that I've been running through now. This is, I think, the fourth uh, of a series of 12. Uh, and today we're going to talk about blood flow, fistula integrity, and optimal clearance. Uh, the first three have been relatively uh, simple and couched in fairly simple language. This one is perhaps a little bit more uh, complex. Uh, there is question time at the end. So I would suggest if you've got a pencil and paper that uh, if I go through this and there's anything that you don't understand uh, and you want to ask at the end, uh, please do so. In terms of fistulas there, and the flow rates and, and as we lead towards the end of this session, optimal dialysis, there are a couple of questions that are foremost in patients thinking. The first of those is what should the blood flow rate be? Uh, and when we talk blood flow, flow rates, uh, I'm really talking here about, uh, if you like, the pump speed, uh, 300 mils, 400, 450, whatever it might be uh, that you run your pump speed at. Uh, the second question is, does that blood flow rate affect either the integrity and uh, health or uh, longevity of the fistula? Uh, and does it affect dialysis clearance? Over and over, I have read that uh, people advocate blood flow rates of 400, uh, 450, even somebody I remember uh, said that they ran their pump at 520 mils per minute. I don't understand quite why that's so. And I, those who post these gigantic blood flow rates uh, also usually claim that that pump speed has been prescribed or recommended by a dialysis professional, and I find that quite scary. So I'm going to try and deal with some of that shocking information as we pass through this, session, this uh, uh, slide set. Let's talk about then the arteriovenous fistula. That means uh, a surgical bridge which is formed between an artery and a vein. An artery is a a large, well, has to be a relatively large, strong blood vessel with a non-stretchy and very muscular wall. It has to be because it conducts uh, blood at blood pressure, which is a very high uh, internal pressure. A vein, on the other hand, is a low flow blood vessel that can stretch up if it is subjected to higher pressure. There are many sites where you can create an arteriovenous fistula. Basically, they can be made anywhere in the body where an artery and a vein can be joined together. But most are created either at the wrist, uh, so-called a radiocephalic fistula, sometimes down here at uh, just below the, the wrist at the base of the thumb, the so-called snuff box arteriovenous fistula, 
Uh, this is the site of the usual radiocephalic fistula and higher up uh, in the cubital fossa or the bend of the elbow, uh, where uh, uh, is the third most, a uh, third other site commonly used. A key surgical skill to fistula creation is to link an artery in a vein of the right size at the correct angle and with the correct curvature if a bend is required. This will ensure that as little turbulence occurs as the high pressure flow from the artery uh, is conducted into the low pressure stretchy vein. This exposes the first part of the vein to particularly high blood flows. Now this is a diagram that you will find commonly something like this if you uh, look through the internet at the various diagrams of AV fistula. But this is, so this is a typical uh, picture that you might see on the internet. But let's have a think about what's wrong with it. The first one is B, if you like. And this kind of V-shaped uh, junction uh, there's no curvature to this and the turbulence if you were conducting blood flow down an artery and whoosh round the corner into the vein would be significant in this region. This is a similar, uh, perhaps the most usual way in which a fistula is created where the vein is joined to the side of, the, of an artery. But again, this diagram shows a sharp V-shaped junction. And I would argue that that's not a good surgical uh, diagram uh, to be putting out on the internet, but it's the one you usually see. And here is, is uh, again, no curve to this, a direct V-shaped. And interestingly, the artery has been uh, put straight into the vein. Uh, that means that anything going down this artery has been that you've sacrificed an artery to do this. And that's an unusual type of fistula, uh, to say the least. But you see these pictures on the internet and you sometimes look at them and say, I wonder what they were thinking. There is art to retain, uh, retaining a place in medicine. So uh, there is an art to fistula uh, creation. And we'll talk more about that as we go through. What one wants to try and do when making a fistula is to minimize the amount of turbulence that disturbs the normal flow in the vein. Turbulence causes what's called shear stress that deforms and irritates the vein wall. This leads to the bete noire, the black beast, if you like, of, a, of arteriovenous fistulae. Uh, so-called stenosis. A stenosis is a narrowing, in medicine that's the word we use, stenosis, a narrowing commonly of a blood vessel. If you mention stenosis, most people think of classical atherosclerosis, but in an AV fistula, the causes of stenosis are quite different. They relate to surgical technique, and I've already obtusely referred to that, uh, in terms of that diagram, which uh, lacked a U-shaped curve to the creation between the artery and the vein, and flow disturbance, especially turbulence and vibratory mechanics. And we're going to talk quite a bit about turbulence and vibratory mechanics. Turbulence is a destructive force. If you've ever been in an um, aeroplane during a storm and, and been bounced around in an aeroplane, it's quite an uncomfortable uh, and sometimes very scary experience. Turbulence occurs where a high flow perturbs the natural quiet flow of any fluid stream, stream, whether it's in the air, in a plane, in water, in a river, or in a vascular structure such as blood flow. And turbulence is a major contributor to fistula stenosis. Think of a river and its river bank. The two, the bank and the river, are usually in harmony. Water flows gently along the river, nurturing the plants along the bank, which remains stable and undamaged. But the river floods, water rages in, when there's a sudden storm. Plants along the bank are pulled and battered, 
even some bits of the bank may break away. What that tells you is that the turbulence created by the flood has created trouble on the river bank. Turbulence is a damaging force in that circumstance. Look at this diagram here. This is taken from somewhere in Italy, I believe. And uh, here is a nice, normal, green, gently flowing river. Here, joining it is a river in flood because upstream in this area in the mountains has been a storm. So storm water is coming down and mixing in with the calm water leading to turbulence at this point. And you can see the high pressure, if you like, joining the low pressure and creating an area of turbulence. In response to turbulence, the cells that line our blood vessels, and they are called endothelial cells, these cells that line our blood vessels proliferate. That means they, they increase in number and in size. Just as the uh, flood damages the bank of the stream, turbulence irritates, aggravates, and stimulates these endothelial cells that line the blood vessel wall to grow in size and number, and they begin to protrude out into the lumen or the uh, channel down the middle of the blood vessel. And you can see uh, an example here in this schema uh, of cells doing that. And what that does is it causes a narrowing from the usual channel width down to a much narrower uh, width or channel. Your pump speed, uh, remember, uh, dictates your return flow speed. So if you're running your pump at 200, I'm using a figure out of the air, if you're running your uh, pump speed at 200 mils a minute, 200 mils is coming back into the blood vessel. If you're running it at 500, you're pushing back uh, two and a half times that amount of blood into the vessel in any one time. Low flow return tends to cause minimal turbulence and a return to the normal laminar flow, that means parallel flow of blood shortly after the venous needle has returned blood to the blood vessel, the vein. If you have high flow, you create major turbulence and ongoing turbulence further up the vein, which then leads to endothelial cell wall aggravation and the tendency for formation of, an, of, of a stenosis. In a dialysis fistula, the most common site for a venous stenosis is a few centimeters downstream, in other words, in the direction of blood flow, that means towards the heart, from the venous needle return site. And flow-related trouble can occur in other spots. So where are these mechanical hotspots? Firstly, you can have an arterial stenosis, which is generally a narrowing at the arterial anastomosis, where the vein has been joined onto the artery. Sometimes this is due to uh, uh, shrinkage, scarring, as a result of the surgical procedure. And uh, that means that the surgeon has to be very careful about how wide he makes this uh, ju junction here. You can have, as I've just described, venous return stenosis occurring somewhat down the vein. This is a rather truncated or shortened area. You would normally have your needles in this area here. Perhaps uh, it would have been better if this diagram had been longer and the stenosis was further down uh, to be perhaps a bit more correct. Or you could find both uh, an arterial and a venous stenosis in the same uh, fistula. Here we see a, a radiograph, that's an X-ray, if you like, where the blood vessel has been uh, created visible by the injection of contrast or dye, uh, to put it in simple terms. Uh, and you can see there is a narrowing here and there is a narrowing here. Here's the anastomosis. So there is a nearby junction, anastomotic stenosis and a venous stenosis further up. And this is likely where the needles are being placed in this area here. And you can see what happens uh, when that has been 
uh, angioplastied, that means stretched up with a balloon. Uh, so that can be corrected with a balloon. But the problem with angioplasties, and once you start sticking stuff into blood vessels and inflating balloons inside them, that's all very well for a while, but generally you often get a recurrence of that narrowing over time. And that's why people often have to go back for repeated angioplasties because the same segment has narrowed down again. And this shows you an arterial stenosis, often due to clamping of the blood vessel during the surgical procedure uh, or to narrowing with fibrosis after that process. Here is a venous stenosis and that causes an increase in pressure. Remember, this is the direction of blood flow and this is the direction your arterial flow is coming. And it's also the direction in which your return flow from the machine is going, leading to a upstream, if you like. I never know whether it's upstream or downstream. Uh, downstream, certainly in flow terms, a venous stenosis again. We can actually clinically differentiate, often, not always, an inflow stenosis from an outflow stenosis. Normally, a fistula is nicely compressible and the simplest test to determine whether your fistula is healthy is to raise the arm above the uh, heart uh, high above the head uh, and if you do that and and feel the pressure in the fistula the pressure will reduce so as you raise the uh, arm up the fistula flattens out or becomes noticeably less tense on the other hand, if you've got an, an inflow stenosis, you've got a narrowing at this point, you might find the fistula feels feeble or flat or have little pulsation. Or if you've got a narrowing further up, uh, a venous stenosis, this may be engorged and hyperpulsatile. So there are different ways in which we can uh, determine clinically whether a fistula is healthy or whether there is trouble brewing. We've talked about turbulence, let's talk about vibratory harmonics. Vibration, think of the, the, the twang of a plucked musical instrument or the vibration of a smartphone sitting on your table when somebody rings you up on the phone. Vibration sets up a high frequency recurring wave pattern, like that. Uh, the, the fistula trembles and it judders it quivers and it shakes. The vein wall is perturbed, uh, uh, or this perturbs the normal quiet uh, environment of the cells that line the vein wall. So you can think of damage occurring to the vein wall and the cells in the vein wall from turbulence, but also from vibration. It's well known that soldiers need to break step when they're going over a bridge. If they mark in unison, the vibration can cause the bridge to fail. So they break step to reduce those vibrations. Vibration, just like turbulence, is a damage, can be a damaging force, particularly in situations of arteriovenous fistulae. Fistulae are living and moving and delicate structures. And the more venous blood that returns into a fistula, the higher the vibration and the higher the turbulence and the greater the risk of a narrowing occurring. Vibratory harmonics or hum in the vessel wall uh, leads to vibratory disharmony and again predisposes or or uh, causes a uh, stenosis. High flow, also wall deformity, damage and stenosis. So remember, turbulence and vibration are two different physical forces. One is a whooshy kind of swirling uh, disturbance. The other is a much more regular vibratory disturbance. Put together, they can do a great deal of damage. Both of these increase as the blood flow rate increases. The higher the pump speed, the higher the rate of venous return, the higher the venous return, 
the more turbulence, the more vibratory disturbance, and the greater existential, we all know what that word now means since the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, everything about the uh, pandemic uh, has been described in existential terms. This means the greater uh, threat to the life and integrity of the fistula. Fistulas are threatened by flow dynamics at both ends of the dialysis circle and in the middle too. If we look at the threat at the arterial extraction site, if you pull blood out too fast, pump speed again, that will cause a fall in the arterial pressure. The arterial pressure is always a negative pressure. You will increase the negativity as you suck a negative pressure, you're sucking blood out of the fistula. If the arterial pressure is too negative, the pump speed is too high, that will lead to an alarm sounding. And that alarm is telling you that the fistula is not able to supply enough blood at the pump speed you have been running at. An arterial alarm is yelling at you, slow down, you're pulling blood out too fast. If we look at the threat to the pump in the circuit, the pump itself can lead to trauma as blood is drawn from the arterial lead needle by a blood pump. Commonly, as you know, in most of our machines, uh, it is still uh, fashioned as a roller pump. Although some of the newer systems such as the Quanta uh, SC Plus use innovative hydraulic systems and that uh, suggests it might be kinder to our blood as it passes through the pump. But in a roller pump, just watch the pump. Use your eyes. See how it squeezes blood forward as the roller pump goes around and around and it pulls this column of blood round and through the pump. It massages the blood forward in a pulsatile flow towards the dialyzer. And you can actually see and feel the blood lines as they jiggle and wiggle with the force of it. If we go back and you imagine your blood being squeezed by this roller pump, as that happens, this can actually do damage to the blood cells, red blood cell destruction, and it can lead to hemolysis, particularly if there is high blood flow rates. Hemolysis, that means a red cell that is literally damaged and squeezed and pummeled as it goes past the pump, until it bursts. Hemolysis can also occur with high pump speeds, for example, as used in heart-lung bypass systems during heart surgery. The higher the pump speed, the greater the risk of hemolysis. Red cells are literally pummeled till they burst, and this can have an effect on anemia. It can release free pigment, hemoglobin, from the red burst red cells into the bloodstream. That's not a very good thing to happen either, but I'm not going to go into explaining uh, anything about anemia and free hemoglobin on this uh, slide set. But nevertheless, this is a consequence or can be a consequence of uh, high pump speeds. Let's now look at the threat at the venous return. A high pump speed can damage the venous return site. Inserting the venous needle alone will cause some uh, vessel wall trauma. Returning blood creates turbulence as it jets back into the vein. The higher the flow pressure, the greater the turbulence, the greater the turbulence, the greater the flow disturbance. Now, I'm not going to talk today about uh, the pros and cons of ladder versus buttonholing. Uh, in other words, needle insertion technique. That is for another discussion. But there are uh, some uh, factors around ladder and buttonholing uh, that can have an effect on this as well. Uh, we'll talk about that in another session. Let me go back to my example of the stream. Think of the two streams joining to form a larger river. If the flow is gentle, imperceptible, mixing the two bodies of water will occur and all is quiet. So gentle flow, imperceptible mixing, quiet, undisturbed system. 
If one stream is in flood, it will cause flow disruption, whirlpools form, eddies ripple the surface. Faster the blood, the greater the turbulence, the more turbulence, the further down the river before all is quiet again and steady flow is returned. So turbulence, the higher the speed, the more turbulence and the further down the vein before normal flow is restored. It's just like that with a high venous return. The faster the blood flow rate, the more deforming the flow effect. We've done all this before. Damage to the vessel wall will occur. Endothelial cells will proliferate. The, ve the vessel will narrow and a stenosis will occur. And this next picture shows you uh, a normal looking vein and a vein with some thickening in the actual wall of the vein, that's this bit here, has been thickened, but there is also this profuse reaction from the cells that normally, this single layer of cells that normally line the vein have proliferated enormously, narrowing the lumen or the channel down which blood is able to flow. Our road authorities often use the catchphrase, road speed kills. To minimize our road death toll, I would argue strongly in dialysis, we should use a similar warning to minimize fistula related damage. DOPS, that is uh, a international study. Uh, the most respected study group of uh, global dialysis practice published their global conclusions a few years ago. Let's look at those conclusions. Blood flow rates were divided into low and high within each country and region based on regional median blood flow rate. In Japan, the median blood flow rate is 200. In Europe and Australia, New Zealand, it's 300. Uh, 325 is a, generally a, a fair maximum in Australia. In Canada, it's up around the 400 mil per minute range. So you can see that different countries and different regions generally practice different uh, blood flow rates. They looked at the number of procedures on fistulas, angioplasty, balloons, stents, surgical revisions, banding, removal of thrombus or, or clot, uh, or dissolving of clot. And these were all significantly higher in those areas which used or in clinics which had higher blood flow rates. For those who use high blood flow rates and have so far escaped trouble, good for you. And I've heard this from people on internet sites, question and answer sites and so on. Oh, look, I run at 400 or 450. I've had no trouble. Well, good for them. But I would suggest that even their bell may well be tolling. If you look at the blood flow rates again and ponder the very different blood flow rates around the world, I am not suggesting, and I don't want to suggest, that US dialysis survival, which is the worst of any world, first world nation, there is no question about that. I don't want to suggest that it's all to do with blood flow rates. There are many, many factors which cause US dialysis to have the worst outcomes of any nation on the planet. It's far too simplistic to, blow, but to, to blame blood flow rates as the only reason for your terrible results and survival rates in the US. But there are data that do show that pump speed is a factor. If you look at DOPS again, the blood flow rate in developed nations versus mortality, and you will see here's the US uh, running blood flow rates of 450. Here is Japan running blood flow rates of 200. Here is Australia and New Zealand running blood flow rates of 300. And you can see that US blood flow rates are significantly higher uh, than anywhere else. Let us now look at mortality. So this is blood flow on this state, blood flow by country. This is mortality in deaths per 100 patient years. 
uh, also by country. And you can see that the graph looks very similar with Japan being lower, Australia about 14 deaths and the US around 22, uh, even a little higher uh, deaths per 100 patient years in this study of DOPS. So it's not necessarily causal, it's an association, but uh, it may, must give us pause for thought. In the US, where many home hemodialysis patients use the next stage system, we don't use that in Australia, uh, higher blood flow rates have been encouraged to compensate for the low dialysate flow rates that the next stage uh, system uses to try and limit the amount of dialysis fluid that is required in that system. And that often pushes people up into the 400, 500, and there was that fellow who said 520, uh, and I gasped and wondered why. Let's think about that now as we move to look at the relationship between blood flow rates and uh, dialysis efficacy or efficiency. Conventional dialysis systems, the Fresenius, Baxter, Gambro, Braun, Nakiso, uh, doesn't really matter, Belco, uh, uh, all depend on blood flow to dialysate flow rates of a ratio of one to two. In other words, we run a dialysis, uh, dialysate fluid water flow rate of let's say 500, the relative blood flow to that would be 250. If you're running a, a dialysate flow rate of 600, you might run a blood flow rate somewhere around 300. So a blood flow rate of 300 would be paired with a dialysate flow, flow rate of 600. In conventional dialysis systems, the blood flow rate is always significantly lower than the dialysate flow rate. That's the way single pass systems work. But to make their machines smaller, the next stage system had to shrink the amount of dialysis fluid that is used. If you go back to that previous slide and we're using 600 mils per minute uh, of dialysis fluid, that means over a dialysis uh, period of say four hours, you're using uh, around 130 to 150 litres of dialysis fluid for that four hour run. The, the next stage system, which wanted to limit the amount of dialysis fluid down to 30 litres or uh, some now a little bit more, but because they've increased their reservoir up to 80 litres, uh, but that's usually for two treatments. Next stage reverses the usual blood flow rate to dialysis fluid rate uh, that is used in single pass systems from the single pass system one to two blood flow rate, half of the dialysis fluid rate. They reverse it to a higher blood flow rate to compensate for the lower dialysis fluid rate, say a two and a half or three to one. So as the dialysis flow rate could only be 100 mils per minute, let's say the 120, the blood flow rate needed to go up towards 400. And most units who run next day systems in the United States tend to encourage that. I would argue this is a case of robbing Peter to pay Paul, like giving with one hand, but taking away with the other. Because in the end, you can't have it both ways, unless you dialyze longer. And those who are on this session who know of me will know that my uh, lifelong passion has been to persuade people towards longer, slower, gentler dialysis. I've always advised longer, slower dialysis with blood flow rates of uh, probably no more than 325. And that's what we use in our facility-based patients or for our home nocturnals, we tend to run a mean blood flow rate of around 225 mils a minute. Now, remember, these are the blood flow rates that are being returned via the pump through the venous needle back into the fistula. So we are 
still pushing blood back into the fistula at 300 or a bit more mils every minute, but that's significantly less than somebody who's running at 450. And our home patients, we can dial this right back to a very gentle and uh, non-vibratory, non-turbulence or less vibration and less turbulence flow rate of 225. It is possible now to do longer next stage treatments with blood flow rates in the mid 300s, but uh, since the next stage has increased the capacity of their dialysate reservoir. Let's now think about dialysis clearance because right, everybody says, okay, you run a high blood flow rate to clear more waste. So the higher you run your blood flow rate, the more clearance, the more bang for you for your buck you get out of your dialysis clearance. But is that so? Let's think about that and look at the evidence about that. And I'm going to try and clear up a misconception that speeding up the blood flow rate improves clearance because in essence, it does not or minimally so. Clearance from uh, the blood of various nasties measured against blood flow rates is a graph that comes originally from Bernie Cano in France and was reproduced by Tom Golper in his core curriculum 2014 for hemodialysis, principles of dialysis and how modalities differ. Right, so the following graphs that you're going to see come from Bernie and Tom. First, let's compare clearance, that means waste removal, with blood flow rate. So waste removal, pump speed. We're going to dwell on this just for a minute. Uh, it looks complicated, but I'll try and make it easy. As blood flow rate rises, clearance also rises rapidly to begin with. So here we are on this graph. This is the amount of blood cleared in mils per minute of waste. Urea, creatinine, middle molecule, vitamin B12, big middle molecule, uh, uh, beta 2 microglobulin. You'll notice that over, here's the blood flow rate along here, 100 mils a minute, 200, 300, where our center-based patients in Geelong run and where most of the American units run up here in the mid 400s. As the blood flow rate increases, yes, there is a, a fairly rapid increase in the amount of clearance, but you'll notice that this graph begins to flatten and it flattens and it flattens and it flattens and it almost gets to being a flat line. So waste is cleared up to around about 325, but from there on, there is very little extra bang for your buck in either urea, creatinine, vitamin B12, or micro, beta 2 microglobulin clearance when you get up to these higher blood flow rates. Clearance rate flattens with very little extra beyond 300 to 325. So increasing blood flow rate, your pump speed, doesn't really make a hell of a lot of difference to the extra amount of waste you clear over and above around that 300 to 325 mark. I've added dotted lines now for 325 clearance, 200 mils a minute, 500, 210 mils per minute, minimal additional clearance, but a whole lot of increase in flow rate and potential damage to fistulas. So is it is that worth that? And the answer, I believe, is not. Now let's return to clearance versus dialys dialysate flow rate. That's the dialysis fluid. So waste removal versus the water process system and the amount of dialysate uh, that you use. Clearance now is shown on this axis here. And here is the dialysate flow rate. Now, 
the Fresenius, Gambro, Belco, uh, et cetera, systems, all tend to run about 500 to 600 flow rate mils per minute. The next stage, on the other hand, runs down here at 100 or 150 uh, at the most uh, flow rate uh, as well. And what you can see is in terms of the clearance, you get a whole lot more bang for your buck at higher dialysate flow rates than you do for lower dialysate flow rates. So in this instance, there is significant change in clearance with a greater dialysate flow rate. And this is one of the reasons why the single pass systems are more efficient at waste clearance than uh, a low flow uh, dialysate system like the next stage. So if we conclude there, you now know that major fistula damage can occur from turbulence and fast blood flow and vibration, and that this is a function of the pump speed and the return speed of blood from the machine back into the vein. But only a tiny increase in clearance results from that increase in fast blood flow. So the question is, is the trade-off worth it? And I think the answer to that is no. There are a number of references here for those who need uh, to go back to the literature and to, uh, to look at some of this work. And at this point, Dory, I'm going to turn it back to you so that if there are any people who want to ask questions, uh, they can do so. But give me a chance to wet my whistle and have uh, a sip from a coffee cup, which is now uh, happily cold. So if you would like to unmute and ask a question, then um, please do. I just, first of all, was that understandable? I thought it was Yes, great. yes, for sure. Good. Hi, Jane. Thank you for saying that. What, what did you think of the talk? It was very good. It was very good. I'm glad you've recorded it because I'd like to refer other people to it. Absolutely. I, I do have a question, though. How can we get people in the United States to, how can we convince them that a lower blood flow rate is good? Uh, I mean, you kept talking up to 520. Uh, there's a company in the United States that they have on their protocol, you can go up to 600 if you use a 14 gauge needle. And oh, it, it's, it's just hard to discuss this with people. I mean, that's unfathomable to be honest. Uh, and I, as you saw from the graphs of towards the end of the presentation, uh, the bang for buck in terms of, uh, why are you doing that? You're trying to get more clearance uh, of, uh, of waste? Um, that's the understanding. You, that's what they're thinking. Well, it, it, that's simply not true. Uh, are you trying to shorten the amount of time thinking that you'll be able to clear more waste and more water, uh, and that's a, a whole different talk that I give, as Dory will know, on ultrafiltration rates, uh, and that's even more important than waste clearance, but the bang for your buck that you get is minimal, the amount of damage that you do is maximal, uh, and so uh, I think that that is a matter of, uh, of education, uh, it's a matter of misunderstanding of the basic principles of dialysis by dialysis professionals, as well as not, the patients can only be led and educated by uh, a dialysis professional who they assume will be up to speed and know what they're talking about. But unfortunately, often that there is a, 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 a schism between uh, knowledge and uh, practice and uh, I think that is something, br bring them back to this session. Let them read Tom Golper's Principles and Practices of, dial of Dialysis. It's just a misunderstanding or uh, uh, an inadequate understanding of how dialysis works. Uh, now, how you uh, get that across to the 5,000 plus dialysis clinics and all of the staff that run those clinics and advise blood flow rates that you're talking about, uh, I have no idea. Uh, it, it, we just, as 
across Australia, Japan, for example, uh, it runs a much lower blood flow rate than we do. Mm -hmm. um, it's just what we do. And uh, what you do, I would argue, is wrong. I don't know that I've, I've answered the question because I don't know how you re-educate uh, your uh, uh, vast number of dialysis professionals. And sometimes remember that many of your patients are actually not being uh, necessarily advised by dialysis professionals, but by technicians. Exactly. Uh, who have even less understanding and less knowledge of uh, the principles and practices of fluid mechanics. Most nephrologists, some will um, talk about a lower blood flow rate and encourage a lower blood flow rate, but a lot of them just go with the company policies. I, I almost feel like we need to go to the surgeons, to the vascular surgeons and have them start to dictate some things and try to come at it from a different perspective maybe. I've done that a couple of times because I do a lot of talks to the vascular surgeon groups and I've done one specifically, that's where those DOP slides came from is I made, I made those as part of a talk to the VEATH conference. But you know that just reaches the handful of folks who are still there at the end of the VEATH conference. Right. It doesn't have a broader reach. You know, we've, we've, we've shared this information with technicians in the core curriculum for the dialysis technician. The sixth edition has quite a lot of information about blood flow rates. And um, I think that we can get into even more detail the next time, but it was in this last edition. That's good. It's a start, a slow start. Any and other questions? I, I'm actually interested to know whether Jane thinks that there, is there a particular way to reach nurses with this information? Slowly but surely more and more nurses are coming around to understanding it. But What's then again, they'll look at a company policy that says you can go up to, to 600 and very often they'll go for it. But I think slowly but surely nurses are starting to come around. It's just a slow process. Well, I would say why, what is driving them starting to come around and what has to happen to change more information, more information like this. Okay. Just, just more information um, like this. I've really spent obviously uh, my time on, on waste clearance and, and those graphs were all related to uh, clearance of urea creatinine. Uh, beta 2 microglobulin, B12, I think was the other one on the list, mm -hmm. uh, trying to demonstrate to you that the uh, amount of clearance of those substances uh, doesn't change significantly at all uh, once you get blood flow rates up above about 300, uh, 325 range. Uh, and that's well documented. There's uh, a squillion papers in the literature that show that data. Uh, and, and it just is, it's, it's just a physical fact that that's the way it is. Uh, so increasing blood flow beyond that uh, is nonsensical if you're looking for additional waste clearance. The best way to get additional waste clearance is to lengthen the time of the dialysis. Uh, and uh, but I think perhaps their thinking is, oh, if we run a higher blood flow rate, we will be able to shorten the period of time that you're on dialysis. If that's the answer, that if that's their argument for doing a higher blood flow rate, then that is also a dangerous fallacy. Uh, and by shortening the amount of time on dialysis, you have to increase the ultrafiltration rate. And I would welcome you to come back to the talk that I give probably the next one or next one or two on ultrafiltration rates to understand why ripping fluid out uh, with bazooka short-term, short-time dialysis uh, is a, a great way to kill people. Uh, and that's what's actually happening. Uh, and if you look at your mortality rates and you look at uh, ultrafiltration rates, that's much more uh, uh, injurious. A high ultrafiltration rate uh, is much more injurious uh, than any difference uh, or any change you might get in clearance. So the answer, if, it, if high flow rates are being used to minimize time, then you're barking up the wrong tree and you're doing untold damage uh, and causing untold morbidity and mortality uh, to patients in the process.
That's probably true. Mm -hmm. Dawn, do you have a question? I, I don't really have a question. Um, I do, I do want to share and uh, Dory and I chatted a little bit through chat before we got started. Um, my husband has been on home hemo uh, since 2009. This is his second time around and after a transplant that had failed. And um, we run at 450. Um, his clearance is good. His labs are amazing. And he's had the same fistula. He's only had one fistula the first time around and one fistula this time around without, and it's huge. I mean, when they do the, um, the transonic to check the flow, it's, it's off the charts. He's got an amazing fistula. And so I, I, I think your information is really helpful and I think it's good. I also know that when we are running as, as, cause I don't just bump him up to 450 right away. It's like, I start out at two and then I gradually increase to, you know, watch his pressures and then we gradually increase. But if he, if his pressures are running high, then I will run him slower. You know, safety, safety is the key, but I do understand what you're saying. Yeah. When, when I'm talking, I mean, this, it obviously, uh, if you're running a, a, a 450 and your fistula is working well, not everybody is going to, uh, to run into trouble. Not everybody's going to develop a stenosis. Uh, this is a statistical thing sure. where you're looking at, you know, a thousand patients or 10,000 patients and the, the chances of you developing trouble increase with speed. That doesn't mean any one individual will run into any, will necessarily run into trouble. And that's kind of the thing that um, I found on uh, the Facebook site that people would throw back at me and say, well, I've had no trouble at all, so it must be all right. That's fine for the individual, yeah. but you have to look at uh, a population basis and the risk, and the risk is greater with the higher flow rates. <clears throat> you might find that the numbers are just as good at three at three twenty five or three fifty as they are at four fifty. Sure, okay. sure. Yeah, I know his his KT over V last month was three point one five. When you know they aim for, I think it's two point five, um, is what they're aiming for. And so I mean, he's got really good clearance. I I think that's yeah. they're shooting kind of low. Um, I'm laughing because I know what I know John is going to say. was next. smiling at the, when you <laughs> raised KTV. I'm not going near KTV today, Dory. I, I can't do it. Uh, but that's I know, another point. I know I've, had, I've had conversations online with Dory and some of the other people in the groups like, okay, please explain this to me because I, you know, I want to make sure I am doing what is safe, safest for, for my husband. I, you know, that's the key. I want him to be able to do dialysis at home but I want him to be safe. I want him to have a long and healthy life as safe as possible. Uh, how long are his treatments done? He averages right around three hours. How many times a week? Seven days a week. He's getting 21 hours, which is... Your figures would be fine if you have, almost if you halved your blood flow rate, but um, you don't really need to um, uh, push it at that speed, I would have thought. I mean, I... I need to always to be very careful on these um, sessions that I'm not giving any individual any advice because I can't do that because right. I don't know the circumstances of any single individual. And so what I try to do is, 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 is talk in generalities about uh, what are perhaps the risks of, but not but over a population basis, but not as, as an individual. Uh, but uh, if you're doing 21 hours a week, seven days a week at three hours, uh, that's uh, that's good dialysis, and uh, I'm I'm not suggesting that you would uh, necessarily. Uh, in fact, I I would encourage you not to reduce your hours, but you could quite easily reduce your flows and get the same result. Okay. okay. It, even though his his flows don't seem to be bothering him, it be some people don't realize how the high flows are affecting them, like their hearts will pound or they'll feel anxious during treatment. And that can be because their blood is moving so quickly through the machine. Sure. And sometimes it just, it might be interesting if, if his team is on board to do a little experiment and drop it to 350 and see if he feels any different. 
I could definitely mention that to them and see see if yeah. they'd be willing to, to give it a try. Yeah, you need to do that with the approval of your team. Yeah. And, uh, you know, maybe he'll feel the same, but maybe he'll feel um, better. When we when we started again on home hemo um, after his kidney rejected, it was again, three days on, take a day off, three days on, take a day off. And he says, dude, I'm doing this six days a week. Can I just do it seven? Because I feel good. I just, just you know, I want to do it every day. And they're like, yeah, go ahead. So That's it was great. his idea. That's an unusual clinic that would that would let you do that. Yep. Mm. Uh, and more strength to their bow, if I might say so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You've got a good clinic. Yep. Oh, that sounds like a great clinic. I did have one question. There was one point, John, that I felt like you kind of skipped past it. When we were on that diagram of the four different ways a fistula can be created, and you talked about three of them and the, having the sharp Vs and not having a nice curve, does that mean that the first one, the side to side, is preferable? Because I noticed you didn't talk about that one. Uh, we tend not to do side to sides. We tend to do um, uh, end to side. Uh, end of uh, we tie the vein, uh, cut the vein, uh, but we we would U it, uh, U shape, okay. right, so that uh, the the blood flow from the artery to into the vein is as smooth and uh, curved uh, nicely as possible. Uh, that all always depends upon the anatomical site. Uh, it depends upon the individual's anatomy, uh, how easily or well you can do that. But if there is an opportunity to do uh, a, a nice gentle curve as opposed to uh, some sort of um, sharp uh, uh, angle associated between the artery and the vein, we would encourage and do that. Um, the, uh, some, uh, uh, I, I didn't really mean to skip over that, uh, but some people do do uh, side to side anastomoses. Um, we tend to not do that. One of the pr problems with doing side to side and without ligating, that means tying off the uh, the distal end of the vein is that you get um, uh, back pressure down into the hand and often with swelling of the hand and uh, an, uh, an uncomfortable hand in so doing. We've got uh, an, an awful lot of veins that dry, drain the hand. So losing one vein uh, uh, to sacrifice to join uh, as a, uh, an end to side with an artery uh, is not a particular problem in terms of drainage to the hand, but if you transmit um, uh, high arterial pressure back down the, uh, the vein towards the hand, uh, that can cause uh, symptoms and we tend to avoid doing that um, anastomosis unless uh, sometimes you need to or uh, it, it seems to be an appropriate thing to do given the anatomy, but uh, we would normally do an enticide. Does that help? It, that does help. I'm, I'm a different question entirely. I'm not sure how familiar you are with the new endovascular uh, AVF creation, but yeah, does yeah. that change your thinking at all about speed or is that's going to create pretty much the first uh, option there by doing an end to side. Mm -hmm. um, you can always if there is a, a retrograde uh, uh, pressure going back down towards the hand by doing that endovascular uh, um, formation of a fistula rather than surgical technique, doing it radiologically and uh, with uh, magnets. And, you know, I'm not going to go into the, the, the details of that. You can always go back later on, if need be, and tie off the peripheral vein. Thank you so much for a wonderful, informative talk. I really feel like this was um, one of the best ones and they've all been good. So thank you. And we will have the recording ready and then we'll figure out what the next topic is. Thank you thank so you much. Doctor. That was very good. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Have a wonderful night, everyone. Thank you for your time.